Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers, and I will serve as your host today. Uh, you can also see on the screen our presenter for today, uh, Edward Blackman, who I'll introduce here momentarily. Uh, today's webinar is a lead up to the uh, annual Lean Leadership Week, which is actually made up of two different events, the Lean Accounting and Management Summit, as well as the Lean HR and People Development Summit. Uh, these two events are obviously by their names uh, designed for those in accounting, human resources, uh, operations, executive leadership, and of course our friends in the uh, continuous improvement community. You can learn more about those events as well as other upcoming events uh, by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash summits, leanfrontiers.com slash summits. Just two points of logistics before we get started. Uh, today's short presentation is being recorded. Uh, you can look for a message shortly after we finish with a link to the recording. Please do share this with others in your organization. And due to the short nature of our presentation today, we will not be fielding questions. However, our presenter will provide his email address if you have uh, further questions. So with that said, let me introduce our presenter for today. Uh, Edward Blackman. Uh, Edward is owner of Kelda Consulting and has 20 years experience as not only a conference keynote speaker, but an executive business improvement leader focused on behavioral systems, lean leadership development, employee skill development, strategy, agile, and operational excellence. So Edward, this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first time we've actually met um, unless we perhaps met somewhere in our distant past, but it's uh, great to meet you. Great to have you here. Really appreciate you uh, delivering this presentation for us today. Thank you, Dwayne um, and Lean Frontiers for sponsoring the webinar today. My name is Edward Blackman, and I will be presenting on combining behavioral science with Toyota Kata. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the techniques for acquiring the skill of Toyota Kata and how to help with that adoption of that skill throughout your own organization. Brief background on me, uh, Dwayne's already shared quite a bit, uh, but I've been doing this work for quite a while in a number of industries. Uh, I'll have my website and email address up on the last slide as well if you don't catch it right now. Some examples of my work uh, here are a number of videos, podcasts, uh, articles, and slide decks. Uh, they're all linked along with the video that Dwayne mentioned uh, that will be shared after this a recording of uh, today. We'll also share this slide deck. So you'll be able to click on this and have access to all these materials. A common tool in the Continuous Improvement or CI uh, uh, toolbox, if you will, is the skills matrix. Part of the skills matrix includes the fluency wheel. Uh, which is a way of measuring skill or measuring fluency level with a given skill. On the left-hand side is the key. It goes from level zero and goes clockwise uh, from no fluency to level one, which is a beginner. You've studied something. Level two, you've tried it and actually applied it. Level three, you're independent with applying that skill. And level four, you've actually coached others on that skill. If we move to the center uh, fluency wheel, the assumption is we want to move you today from level one red to the right hand side, level one green. So we're actually not going to try applying the skill today. We're just uh, more learning and studying the skill. If you want to learn more about the skills matrix and fluency wheel, there's a video that's linked down at the bottom. Agenda for today, we'll briefly go over some background on CI concepts, Toyota Kata, and behavioral science, and then we'll dive into the meat of the presentation on how to apply it and develop the skill with others. We have a very diverse audience today and large audience, over 500 people registered for the webinar today. Thank you, everyone. I'm greatly honored and humbled by that. Um, uh, with that, though, the diversity of exposure to Kayata, uh, Toyota Kata is great. So we have people that have been applying it for years and people who are just now learning how to spell Kata. So to uh, give a brief background on it, uh, uh, Toyota Kata is a, a uh, if you will, a book um, 
uh, by Professor Mike Rother over at the University of Michigan. He studied Toyota and some of the leadership patterns and behaviors that occurred within Toyota and codified it in this book. Uh, kata, if you're not familiar, is a tends to be a martial arts term. When somebody's learning Taekwondo or karate or something like that, they'll learn a series of uh, forms or behaviors in order to internalize a given skill. Uh, so applied here, uh, we tend to talk about kata, or Toyota kata, in terms of improvement kata and coaching kata. Some of the visuals or, if you will, artifacts that go along with uh, Toyota kata and are detailed out in the book as well as on uh, Mike Rother's website. And I do want to thank him and credit him for providing some of these visuals today. Uh, are the learner storyboard, the experimenting record, uh, the current condition, target condition uh, board as well. Another piece is the... Uh, kata card uh, for the coach and the learner. So these tend to have the, the five questions uh, on the front with additional questions on the back that a learner and a coach will go through on uh, their learning cycles. In addition to that, there's the uh, four steps for the improvement kata, if you will, taking a journey up a mountain. In the bottom left-hand side, you'll see uh, two, which is where you're at now. That tends to be the actual, or if you will, to use the, the traditional CI vernacular, your current state or your current condition. Moving up to three, which is your target condition, or if you will, future state one, followed by future state two, and so on. All the way to the upper right-hand side, uh, the number one up there, which is your direction or your challenge, or sometimes called ideal state. So switching over from that background on kata, uh, I want to talk about a beautiful intersection between continuous improvement and behavioral science as depicted in Steven Spears' Harvard Business Review article, Learning to Lead at Toyota. If you're not familiar with this, or even if you are, please read it, reread it. It's short. It's just like five pages. There's a lot of wonderful lessons that are um, buried within here on how to develop a learning organization as well as how to develop a specific skill, in this case, problem-solving behaviors. The protagonist in the article is a leader, an executive who is newly hired onto an organization and goes through a standard training and development approach to develop his problem solving skills. One of the key messages within was the coach noticed that the learner in this case was not developing problem solving skills fast enough. So set up a slightly different environment and had the learner, the leader, apply even more smaller experiments, smaller PDCA cycles, if you will, smaller problem solving behaviors in order to learn faster. The key there was that more fluency, more uh, repetitions, more feedback and coaching cycles, more learning cycles developed the behavior better and faster. Some of the behavioral science key concepts that we'll uh, utilize today, behavioral pinpointing, this is a great way to operationally define what is an actual behavior. When we talk about behavior, behavioral science, to demystify a bit, it's basically what you can observe if I recorded you on a camera, what we would actually see, what we would hear. Those are behaviors, what are observable. Uh, another item is distinction training procedure. This uh, typically goes by a, a slightly different terminology, but the idea is how do we help people distinguish between different stimuli in their environment? This is a very common uh, piece when individuals are growing up and learning and acquiring skills, and we'll take a deeper dive into that in a minute. Another piece is closed loop learning cycles. Uh, by this, I mean an individual uh, performs some behavior, gets feedback on it, a little bit of correction and direction, and then repeats and does another learning cycle. And more and more learning cycles develop more and more behaviors. Another piece, it's an unfortunate name, but terminal behaviors. Uh, terminal behaviors, if you will, just think of as goal behaviors. So if we think of the end in mind, if we want to develop a behavior, develop a skill, what does that end behavior look like? And we talk about it and we have that discussion before we actually do the behavior and then we design everything with that goal of that terminal behavior in mind. When we're doing that, we want to take into account the contextual applications of that skill. 
By that I mean, if we have an individual who's going to apply this skill, apply, if you will, Toyota Kata or some other skill, CI behavior, in a manufacturing setting, the design for developing that behavior, the examples that we use, will probably be di different than if that individual is going to be applying the skill in a Toyota Kata in an IT environment or in an ICU or in a hospital uh, or in a lab. So keep those in mind when we're designing training. Now, it's good just to reflect a little bit on our own learning experiences. Some of what I'm going to say today is should be intuitive because you've gone through it yourself. When you studied math, you likely learned addition and subtraction before you learned multiplication and division. Algebra before trig, trig before calculus. You started basic, developed fluency with basic items, and then got more complex, more advanced. Driving is another example. You likely learned in a safe environment, low stress in uh, parking, turning, steering in a parking lot before you ever hit the city streets or a highway. With that in mind, we also want to keep uh, uh, in mind the analogy and take it a step further of how much of the history of a car was actually useful for you to learn how to drive. Uh, this starts to get into some taboos in the CI culture and Toyota Kata uh, culture, if you will, but think about it this way. Uh, would learning about the history of automobile manufacturing help you to actually drive a car? All right? It might be useful and interesting, but at the end of the day, does it actually help you with parking? Uh, probably not. Uh, another example is instruments. Uh, we talk about these quite a bit when we talk about uh, kata, but um, you likely learned, if you play musical instruments, you likely learned uh, basic children's songs before more advanced uh, items. To take it a step further, you likely learned specific chords within a song and developed fluency with those before progressing onto the entire song. Uh, if you're in leadership, you likely led a small team and developed fluency and some success with that before you led larger teams. So I want to give uh, credit to the Target IT uh, Dojo. I uh, visited them in the past. A wonderful organization. They're, the dojo in this sense just means a, a training facility, if you will. This was targeted on uh, agile and scrum training and development. Individuals would go into this environment um, and develop their agile and uh, scrum skills. In there, they had this beautiful cartoon, and uh, the main point of this is uh, very basic. Teaching is not the same thing as learning. So we have to check and validate uh, constantly that what we're teaching um, is actually helping the student, the learner, learn something. Um, it also helps the coach to see if we're on the right track or if we need to adjust. Some instructional design principles, uh, tried and true ones from decades of uh, experimental science um, and applied. Start simple, obtain fluency before going on to advance, uh, get help from a coach, does wonders. Um, question all the content. And this might be a hard one for some of us CI print practitioners, but the way we were taught might not necessarily be the best way to teach others. Question all of the value of the content, and I'll call out something in particular. Um, I've been taught repeatedly the house of Toyota. Uh, I, I can say that uh, I've never actually, outside of teaching somebody the house, had them uh, use that to help them solve problems, to design problem-solving systems, develop scientific thinking. So if that's the case, why do we still teach it? Now, I, I enjoy it. I, I like the House of Toyota. I think it's really good for more advanced practitioners to learn the context of a, of a system. Uh, but out of the gate, uh, no, let's start with some of the basics first. With that in mind, if we're teaching a 40-hour, a full week of uh, CI training or kata training, look at it in five-minute chunks. Was that piece actually adding value to the learner? Was it helping them acquire the terminal behavior, that, that skill that we want them to apply? Was it actually providing value in that direction? And if we think yes, how would we know? Uh, again, contextual applications make the skill practice as close to the real life application as possible. The best way, honestly, is OJT on the job training, but that's not always safe or practical. Another piece, uh, last piece on measurements. Um, 
if the goal is to have somebody have fun and enjoy the training, then yes, satisfaction surveys are a great way to measure that. But if you want people to acquire skills in addition to the training, we might have to consider other ways of measuring whether or not the training was effective, not just liked. Uh, activities, simulations are great. They can be engaging, they can be fun, but just remember that more learning cycles with feedback is better. Uh, to deeper dive back into the distinction training procedure mentioned before, if we look on the left-hand side, non-relevant examples are non-work-related examples. They're useful for developing learning with an individual. Uh, we look at the first one. Uh, we have kids, if you will, identify pictures. And when they properly distinguish between a tree and a dog, and that means identify a tree when it is a picture of a tree, not a dog, only then do we go on to more complex and a finer grain distinction of types of trees, or if you will, types or breeds of dogs. The next example works with auditory stimuli as well. The a proper identification of the sound of a piano versus a guitar is key before worrying about getting uh, more detailed with types of pianos or types of guitars. Going over to the right hand side with relevant examples or work related examples, if you will. Unfortunately, we'll often have as CI practitioners conversations in front of new learners about, well, no, it's not really a solution, it's an experiment, or no, it's not really that, it's a countermeasure, right? These types of conversations, while value added, are not value added at that point in time if somebody is still trying to learn the distinction between a problem statement and a solution statement, right? Go into the finer grain analysis and the distinctions later after they've acquired the basic school, um, skill sets. So unfortunately, uh, a lot of people can probably relate uh, to these statements. They're very common in CI transformations and honestly, I'll say transformations in organizations in general. Uh, so you may have heard or said, uh, leadership doesn't get it. Why aren't leaders walking the talk? Um, oh, and another common one. We can't get enough buy-in for fill in the blank, in this case, CI or Toyota Kata. From a behavioral science perspective, these are all just variations of a theme of blaming the learner, which you never want to do. The learner hasn't learned. The teacher hasn't taught. So we have to change how we teach, change how we develop. If we keep running into these obstacles, these barriers, these common struggles for transformations, we have to change our approach to how we're doing this and stop blaming the learners. With that in mind, a uh, beautiful technique from Agile and Scrum, if you will, is that of a persona. And so we're going to introduce Kaya. Uh, Kaya is an IT director for a manufacturing company. On a daily basis, she spends most of her time in meetings, either conference room meetings or virtual meetings. Last year, she actually went through a full week of CI training called Toyota Kata. Had a lot of fun. There were simulations that were involved, but at the end of the day, she was left wondering, how do I actually apply this to my daily work? Not only that, Kai is actually somebody that's bought into CI. She likes it. She sees value in it, but she's really struggling with applying it herself and getting her colleagues to try it. I like this phrase a lot. Crawl, walk, run. So if our goal is to develop a full-blown Toyota Kata system to help transform organizations to become better, to become competitive, to develop innovations. We start basic and move on from there. Let's see if we can get people just to develop the skill of distinguishing a problem from a solution. I've done this hundreds of times with various individuals. I Pre-COVID, I used to do this uh, marker board style um, uh, a lot. Uh, now I do this virtually often um, uh, with laptops and uh, uh, virtual marker boards and things like that. But the idea is still the same. I'll move on to this slide so you can actually read it. Um, uh, a simplified version of the question set that you saw earlier is what is your goal? meaning um, what is your future state or your ideal state? Uh, what is your actual, what, meaning your current state? Where are you at today? Where do you want to be? 
read for those two questions. Three is what is the cause for the gap between one and two, right? That's the problem that we're trying to solve, that gap. Four is what is the plan to close that gap? And then five as a leader, how may I help you with any of those? So we can be even more basic, even more simple with this. Let's just do one and two, uh, or the two questions. What is the problem we're trying to solve? And what is the plan solution? Let's just start there and then build up to the full five questions and then build up more after that and more after that. Uh, just a refresher for some of you, probably good problem statements. Don't include solutions. Don't just reverse engineer your solution and put it into your problem statement. Uh, also, uh, shout out to Herman Miller and, um, Sensei Oba, uh, for this one, I still struggle with this today. After all these years, it is hard to avoid using the terms no and not in your problem statement. Doing so limits your thinking, limits your options down the road, and honestly tends to imply a specific countermeasure, which again, adds no value. We want a true current condition, true problem statement. Uh, good problem statements also contain numbers. It's nice to have those in there for directionality to see, you know, is higher or lower better, as well as to see progress or lack thereof. Uh, to do another shout out for mental innovations over in Ann Arbor, uh, Richard Sheridan and crew, uh, they would say right now is a really good time for an example. <laughs> so let's do that. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? The red column that you see there, this is a common one. A bad problem statement is staff are untrained on how to fill out our IT requirements form. That's a bad problem statement because guess what? That only gives you one option. The only thing you can do for a potential solution is what? Train staff on how to fill out the form. No. A better problem statement over a green column is the software requirements our internal business partners gave us on our, old, on our form are old, outdated by the time we use them and are frequently filled out incorrectly. That gives you way more options than just training. Another one, and this, yes, it's home for us CI practitioners. This one pops up all the time. A bad problem statement is no standard work. One, it only gives you one path to go down, implement standard work. Another is it contains the word no. So you're just implying your solution there. That's, that's lazy problem solving. A better way of making the same statement or the true intent of your current condition over in the green column is a highly varied process resulting with um, or producing results uh, from an unpredictable process. To get a little more complex, we'll uh, do a shout out to Sensei uh, Bill Casentino. Um, he's a uh, Toyota Kata mentor and master guru. He gave me this example of drills. Uh, so in the red, no electric drill. And so the only solution you can go down is buy an electric drill in order to make a hole in the wall to hang pictures. No. A better uh, problem statement in the center, green, is can't hang pictures. Well, that gives you a lot of options. Um, put a hook on the wall, put a nail or a screw on the wall. And then, yes, also, if you want, buy a drill to make a hole in the wall. An even better problem statement all the way to the right, including numbers, metrics, zero holes in the wall, and the goal is to get to one. Now, to take it up even more um, for from a complexity standpoint, to build on the problem versus solution statement, now we use all five questions. And I'll be honest with you, I've, I've used this underground sprinklers examples a lot, but it really seems to hit home with people. The column in red is a complete waste of time. All you're doing for all the five questions is reiterating that you've already solved a problem from your perspective and you just want to buy underground sprinklers. Filling that out and answering all five questions that way adds no value at all. It's a waste of time. Instead, a better way of going is the green column. What is your goal? Beautiful lawn. Where are you actually at now? I have dead grass everywhere. What's the cause? High heat, low moisture, foot traffic. By the time you get to plan on this one, you have a lot of options other than underground sprinklers. Above ground sprinklers. Put lock, uh, rocks on your lawn instead of grass. Um, plant 
drought tolerant trees but you see how it frees up your options for where you can go by the time that you get to that plan that solution that experiment uh, a business relevant example here uh, future state one we want 50 percent identified savings opportunities visibility to those savings opportunities by end of year 2021 where are we at today actual current state we're at 20 percent. so the gap the problem that we're trying to solve is that 30% gap by the end of the year 2021. What's the cost for that gap? Multiple disparate, incomplete systems of record, poor reporting, limited accessibility, right? There's a lot of ways that you can go by the time you get the plan um, if you do the problem statements well. So let's revisit Kaya. In a one hour coaching session, this is what it looks like versus the one week model, right? So what we do is we have Kaya learn the five questions and then we don't ask her, do you get the questions? Does it, do you understand it? Does it make sense to you? No, we have her demonstrate the behavior by writing the questions up on the board, providing feedback when she gets it incorrect, uh, typing them up if it's a virtual coaching session. And that way we can see as the coach a visual for how she is performing with this new skill. Then we take real life examples from her IT uh, department portfolio. There's over 50 typically official projects uh, that they have for the year and a lot more unofficial. Uh, you may have an HR project portfolio, supply chain project portfolio, um, whatever it is, manufacturing, uh, you likely have a list of projects that you can use to practice this question set on. And then simply ask, okay, pick one project out at random. Okay, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? What is a one sentence problem statement, right? Practice on that, get it wrong. Um, Kai gets feedback from the coach and gets better at it. And then we try another project and another project. And all she's trying to do is develop fluency with this problem versus solution statement skill before we start to develop even more and more, do all the five questions and get into root cause as well. And that's a, that's a future discussion. By the end of one hour, she's gone through over six learning cycles, gotten feedback, is getting fluent, at least a level two on this basic, simple question set. And then here's the part I love. They get on fire after this. So people, uh, when they go through this, I see them go to their next meeting and uh, every meeting they have after the one hour coaching session, they're coaching and guiding the other people in the meeting. Hey team, what is the problem that we're trying to solve with this meeting, with this project? And they're actually pretty good at, at coaching people through those questions. And then it just spreads everywhere because people start to ask Kaya, where did you learn this skill? How can I learn it? What should I be doing? This makes sense. It's such a beautiful technique to get alignment before we start getting to the solution area, right? I, I'm going to say that a, a big struggle that we have is not just with um, change management, but it's people learning to line up around a specific problem before they get to the point where they talk about the solution. And guess what? This doesn't just apply to Toyota Kata. We can apply this to any of, if you will, the methodologies, the tools, the concepts within the CI uh, tool set, the CI house, and honestly, beyond just CI skills. So to look at value stream mapping, we likely learn value stream mapping with um, a workflow of boxes, uh, metrics underneath, lightning bolts going up to suppliers and database sources and vendors, first mile, last mile and it's complicated. Let's see if we can get an individual to correctly develop a six box value stream map first, just the boxes, strip out everything else, keep it basic and see if they get fluent with that. And because we work in a business environment around other humans, we need to do this in a group environment too. So the individual develops their fluency, then they go into a group environment. The group develops fluency with just the six boxes of the value stream map. And then and only then do we progress on to adding complexity, adding some of the metrics, and then developing more of the metrics and starting to connect it to the first mile, last mile, and so on. 
So sorry if I got a little preachy today. Uh, I love this topic. I love the possibility and the help that's been provided by behavioral science on making continuous improvement transformations possible and successful. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, Thank you, Lean Frontiers. Thank you, Kelda Consulting, uh, for sponsoring the webinar today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I love talking about this topic. Uh, this video and the presentation deck will be provided um, after today. Uh, love to continue the conversation online. Uh, have a great one. Thank you, everyone. Edward, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we did have some ongoing audio issues throughout that. Uh, just a little bit choppy here and there. But I tell you what, the few hundred people that dialed in, they stayed with us the whole time. So evidently it was uh, 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 enough that they could understand. So thank you. Uh, let me just thank you for uh, the presentation. And maybe you and I can talk offline to see if maybe we want to try to redo this and maybe get a, a different version uh, out to folks. But I uh, really do appreciate all those that hung in there with us. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, you'll receive an email shortly with a link to this recording if you'd like to uh, like to use that. Um, otherwise, look for an email from me with uh, maybe some alternate plans. Um, I also mentioned earlier that this is a lead up to the uh, Lean Accounting and Management Summit as well as the Lean HR and People Development Summit. If your organization could use engagement in their accounting and HR departments in the, uh, the Lean Enterprise, uh, this is for them. Uh, you can learn more by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash summits, and would love to have you part of that virtual event, which takes place in about three to four weeks. So Edward, thanks again, and thanks to all who participated. Have a great day and go do good things. Thank you, Dwayne. Stay healthy. Bye.